Hello, welcome to this week's video homework. Today we're going to be talking about natural selection and evolution. Specifically, I want you guys to be able to recognize and learn some cross-cutting concepts in science, such as being able to identify and use patterns, and being able to connect cause and effect. So we're talking about evolution in this unit. And so I wanted to give you a definition of evolution. It's very simple one line definition and we'll break it down. But evolution is just the change in the genes of a population over time. Now when I say population, I'm talking about a group of organisms who are all of one species who are living together in an area. So this picture here is of a bunch of elk that are living together. It is a population of elk. Now, you can define a population um, however you want, uh, like a humans, uh, you could say the entire population of the earth, but you could also talk about the population of students at Franklin High School. So how you limit how big a population is, is really up to you. We can look at this population of elk, and we can try to observe some change in this population over time. Scientists have actually done that, and they collected data on the average height of the antlers of the elk. Over a 30-year period, they measured the average antler height. And so back in 1985, they measured the average height of the antlers, and they found that there was a peak at around around 13, 12 to 13 centimeters in length. However, when they went back 30 years later and measured the average antler height, they found that the average, there is a peak that was closer to seven or eight. And so the antlers over time shrank. Over time, over 30 years, multiple generations of elk the antlers became smaller. So that's a change in a population over time. And we're assuming that this change, that these antlers were controlled by genetics because evolution is all about the change in the genes. And so we'd have to assume that antler height was controlled by genetics. And that's why the average height of the antlers got smaller uh, was because the genes changed over time. And this explanation doesn't take into account why the genes changed, why the antlers became smaller. Um, it's just an observation that they did. And so that is an observation of evolution. So how does this change occur? As I said, I want you guys to be able to identify cause and effect in nature, the cause of evolution is natural selection. Natural selection drives the vast majority of evolution. Natural selection doesn't have as easy of a definition as evolution does, um, so I can't just give you a one-line definition. Uh, natural selection actually has four different parts, so let's make sure we review what those are. First, is that organisms have the ability to reproduce and therefore they can increase their population size. As long as organisms can continue to reproduce and possibly increase their population, natural selection can occur. Number two, there is a diversity of genetic traits which can be passed down. So within a population, there is genetic diversity because of mutations, because the DNA, the genes, have become mutated, have changed ever so slightly over time. Those mutations build up in a population, and it makes the population have some slight differences. The example with the elk in 1985, yeah, there were some elk who had really short antlers, and there were some elk that had really big antlers, but on average, the majority of the elk had antlers that were around 12 to 13 centimeters. That average changed. And so this diversity, this range, is what we're talking about when we talk about the diversity of genetic traits. And if they're genes, that means they can be passed down. Okay, number three, 
there must be, and there always is, competition for resources. When I say resources, I can mean lots and lots of different things. Um, it could be resources for food or water, it could be shelter, it could be uh, ability to hide from predators. Uh, there are lots of different resources uh, out there. Um, but essentially what the competition for resources means is that not everyone survives. Organisms have the ability to increase their population size, but not everyone survives. So when you take these three things into account, the results that you get, the effect that you get, is that the best traits, the individuals with the best genetic traits, have a competitive advantage. And therefore, they pass down those good traits to their offspring more often than the individuals with the bad traits. And so in the future, there will be more individuals with the good traits than the bad traits. And that is natural selection. A key thing to note here, if we go back to the elk antler example, I am not saying that the antlers who were alive in 1985, I'm not saying that their antlers got smaller over 30 years. I'm not saying that the antlers physically shrank over 30 years. What this data is saying is that the individuals who had smaller antlers actually had a competitive advantage. And when they had offspring, they had more offspring, which had the same smaller antlers and the elk that had big antlers had fewer offspring in future generations so over multiple generations these guys has start, have started to die out while these individuals with the smaller antlers have increased in population size all of that together is natural selection and so when we're talking about these traits these advantageous traits we can use a word to describe them. We call them adaptations. Adaptations is any trait that can help an organism to survive. Snakes have lots of adaptations. Actually, all of our traits are adaptations. They've all at some point helped us to survive. Each adaptation is specific to its environment. Um, so while the Adaptation in this snake of having a yellowish tan brown color is advantageous in its environment. This other snake down here with the red and black and white colors, that would be an adaptation in a different environment where there's more red and brown soil to blend into. Each adaptation is specific to its environment, and if that environment changes, if the environment changes, the adaptations will also change. Let's look at another example. This example might be very familiar to you, um, or it might not, but it should be familiar to you because it's one that's often used to describe natural selection and evolution. In England, there is this moth called a peppered moth, and it's called a pepper moth because it has a mix of gray and black pigments all over its body. Normally, a peppered moth lives on the bark of trees, and those trees have the same coloration, this gray and black peppered coloration. However, over time, that environment changed. Around 1840, humans started burning a lot more coal to make electricity. And when they burned coal, their factories were very dirty, and they produced a lot of soot, which was black smoky oily residue which landed on the trees and made the trees much more black than the gray that they used to be and so over time that environment changed and the peppered moths also changed so in 1840 when the environment was still mostly gray the average color of all the peppered moths they had 82 percent gray on them while only 18 percent was black. 40 years later, in 1880, the peppered moths had only 56% gray, while 44% of their backs were covered in black spots. And by 1920, when the environment was very dark, the average coloration was only 15% gray. There are only some 
15% gray spots, but the majority, 85% of their back, was covered in black spots. Now, the way we can figure this out isn't that we go back to 1840 or 1880 and count up the number of moths. Scientists collected a bunch of moths and stored them in museums. So you can right now go to some museums and look back at the hundreds of moths that they collected and pinned, killed, and pinned into these cases, and you can count up what did the moths look like in 1840, and then you can go a couple shelves down and count up the moths that they have in 1880, and then go down and count up the moths that they had in 1920, find the average coloration of these moths. So the question is, why did this occur? So in the 1840s, the environment was more similar to this. The majority of the moths had mostly gray, which allowed them to blend in to the tree trunks. And so their predators, these birds, had a difficulty finding the mostly gray moths. But they could easily identify the mostly black moths, which were present, but they were there were much fewer black moths, and the birds would eat them. And so the grayer moths would be able to have more offspring and pass down their traits. But by 1920, when the factories produced a lot of smoke, it made the trees a lot darker, and now the black moths blended in and passed on their traits because they survived, while the mostly gray moths were easily found, and the birds, the predators, could eat them, and so the gray moths weren't able to pass on their traits as much. So again, let's take a look at how this occurs. We said it's natural selection. Organisms can reproduce and increase in population. All of these moths could reproduce and pass on their traits. There is genetic diversity. You can see it in the average color of moth. There are some that were more black and others that were more gray, and there was a diversity of that. That diversity was because of genetic mutations. There was a competition for resources. In this case, it was ability to blend in. Not all the moths could blend in as well as others. Prior to 1840, the black moths couldn't blend in, but around 1920, it was the gray moths that couldn't blend in. And so again, if you combine that, you have the better trait in 1920s, the black uh, coloration. They had more offspring, and so future generations had more of the black spots and fewer of the gray coloration. That is natural selection. I'm not saying, again, that this gray moth right here ended up mutating its own cells and changing its own cells and became this black moth down here 80 years later. That's not what happened. This individual didn't change within its lifetime. I'm saying that this individual, this gray moth died while this black moth survived and had a lot more offspring than the couple of gray moths that did survive. And so it's a change over multiple generations. Future generations have more of these adaptations. So the next thing that you need to be able to note, we talked about cause and effect of natural selection causing evolution, but you also need to be able to identify patterns and use those patterns to make predictions. So if I were to look at the average coloration of gray over those different moths, I could graph that percentage. 82% gray, 56% gray, 15% gray. And I could ask the question, I could make a prediction, how much gray coloration will there be in 1960, way off in the future. Well, future compared to this data set. What would the average coloration be? And I can use this pattern of changing genes to make a prediction of where, somewhere down here, how much gray coloration would there be 40 years into the future from 1920. So I can use the pattern of rate 
of change. It's a rate, just like you would do in a linear equation in math. It's rise over run. So you have a rise, which is the change in percent, and a run, which is the change in years. So the rise between 1840 and 1880, in this case it's a drop, that was about a drop of 26%. And then between 1880 and 1920, rise over run, it was a drop of 41%. That averages out to 33% change over each of those time periods. So that was our rise. Our rise is negative 33.5. Our run, how much distance, how much over did we go from 1840 to 1880? That's 40 years. And from 1880 to 1920, that's another 40 years. So our run is 40 years. Our rate of change is 33 or negative 33.5 percent every 40 years that's our rate we can use that pattern to make a prediction so i asked how much gray coloration will there be in 1960 1960 is 40 years after 1920 so we'd imagine that we would go from 15 percent gray and we would subtract 33.5 percent well, 15 minus 33, that's zero, and you can't go below 0% in this case. So we would predict that in 1960, all of the moths would be 0% gray or 100% black. That would be our prediction. However, the environment actually changed. Around 1920s, we ended up cleaning up our factories. We didn't produce as much soot, and so the trees, instead of staying black, they went back to their natural gray color. The trees became gray again around 1920. And so by 1960, the environment had changed a lot. What will happen? Again, I said that adaptations are specific to the environment. So if the environment changes back to being mostly gray, then we would assume that the moths would go back to being mostly gray. And we can use that same pattern, our same negative 35% every 40 years. And if the environment switched, we could make the assumption that it would be a positive 35% change in 40 years. And so in 1960, they would go from being 15% gray and we would add 33.5%. And what you can actually find, if you go back in the records, is that by 1960, the moths were 48% gray. The coloration, the pattern, would switch, and the adaptations would start to become uh, more and more gray again. So, I hope that was helpful. And if anything didn't make sense, make sure you write down a question. Also, when we're doing notes, over in the side column, you'll want to do some reflections, add some thoughts or ideas, any questions that you have. And then down at the bottom, maybe tomorrow after you've taken these notes right before class, write a summary down at the bottom to make sure you can remember what was discussed in this video. And I look forward to seeing you in class um, and hearing what wonderful questions you have. It was just a little while ago I glued my ears to the radio. The announcer was saying we better beware, a crisis was hanging way up in the air.